Side effects of shake and shakes. Is it almost like I came up the stairs instead of the bed? Were they able to give you any other kind of medication? Just didn't have the antibiotics. That's what they were giving me, which is funny. But the other one is kind of slow term. Oh, you did? Yeah. Four months, probably not. Four months. But they gave me some antibiotics. Okay. Three of them are dead. I took about 10 days. And I seem to work fine. You to finish them all? Yes. But the, uh, so the side effects of the. I was going to walk up the ramp and walk up the street. I was going to be finished. I didn't know. I didn't know. Just take it easy and don't overdo it. Well, the first two days, I don't think you're going to be your own. I'm going to take it over here. 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 <laughs> Is Wayne our cheering section today? No, he's our harshest critic. Oh, okay. That's true. That's true. Yeah. We'll call the meeting to order. And uh, Dan, will you call us roll, please? Deputy Mayor Baggett. Here. Councilmember Brown. Here. Councilmember DeCourcy. Here. Councilmember Holman. Here. Councilmember Peloza. Here. Here. Councilmember Whale. Excused. Okay. Uh, we're going to change the agenda a little bit tonight. Uh, <clears throat> uh, let's see. I think we're going to uh, insert the uh, King County uh, uh, Raft Comprehensive Solid Waste Management Plan down under 4A. We're going to move that up under the uh, after the public art selection, uh, which is 3B on the agenda. So I think the, the first thing we have is the Brandon Park and Reddington Levy use agreement. Yeah, um, staff park planner Jamie Kelly's here to give the report on that. Jamie? Oh yeah. Great.
So the purpose of this um, presentation is to uh, recommend to approve the resolution to execute a use agreement. Um, it's basically a loose end for the Reddington Levy uh, project um, that was back in 2013. Uh, the city entered into a um, interlocal agreement with King County and the King County Flood Control District um, for easements across the eastern portion of Brandon Park for the purposes of uh, maintaining the flood control the, the levy flood control structure. Um, basically, the park property was purchased in 1971 from uh, through RCO funds um, at the time. RCO looks at easements across properties as, um, or they, they basically, if you have an easement across a property, then you have to go through this land use, this park land conversion is what they call it. So, um, the area that we're talking about here, so this is a pre-construction, pre-levy construction, pre -construction um, figure here. So the blue line is more or less the levy um, as it was before the setback. And then if you go to the post, the levy is more or less follows the um, paved trail that you see here. So there's not a whole lot of difference in b between the pre and the post. Um, through all kinds of discussions with, uh, with RCO, decided that a use agreement was better um, was, was better suited for the situation than um, an easement across there. Still grants King County um, access for the purposes of, of maintaining their flood control, st flood control structure, um, but it also gets us out of the land, um, the land conversion requirement with RCO. So basically um, this, let's see, so the easement diagram is in the resolution that you guys have in front of you. This 2.99 acres represents basically between the blue line and the, the levee trail. So um, the prior to construction of the levee, there was still access to the river. Um, Post construction, we still have access to the river for, for recreational purposes. We also gained 1.7 miles of paved trail uh, between Brandon Park and um, I Street, which, oops. So the red line represents the entire trail length um, that we gained uh, through the project, and we still have access to the river. Um, so, it's just getting King County out of having to purchase uh, 2.99 acres of property for parkland and we still continue to basically have the same level of, of access to the river um, and we, we gain the 1.7 miles of, of trail. So, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Council Member Holman. When do you expect to bring this before Council? Um, the next Council meeting. Member For those that don't know what RCO is, it's the Washington Recreation and Conservation Office. Sorry about that. That's all right. <laughs> I noticed that uh, <clears throat> we had a little uh, high high water in the river this last time, the mm -hmm. big rain, and uh, it flooded part of the Isaac Evans Park. Yeah. Yeah, it, that happens from time to time. It usually takes the river to get up around 10,000 CFS for that to happen. I don't know what it peaked out at this last time. It was but phase two, as, as yeah, I heard. Yeah. I'm not sure how much CFM that was. But yeah. So, I mean, really, I mean, with the, you know, the, with the levee being set back there, the river is basically has this whole area to take, you know, you know, towards, you know, all the way up to the levee, the river can meander all the way out through there. But we'll still have that river access and the paved trail. So, I mean, from a park's point of view, we didn't really lose anything. We gained, you know, the 1.7 miles of trail, um, but we still have access to the river. So I think it seems like everybody wins. 
there going to be another park in our future? Here? No, but it does help us get the continuation of the um, Green River Trail, hopefully real soon, all the way up to 272nd. Any other questions? Yolanda? Will the trail ever be flooded? No, the, the trail is on the top of the levee, so, it's so it's, it sits up. I forget what the elevation is of that levee, but I mean, it's all, it's engineered to the point where, you know, if, if it comes, even if it comes up to the levee, then it won't ever crest over. I think it would take like a, I don't know, a 12,000 CFS event or 14, I don't remember off the top of my head, but it's a significant um, flow to get up over that levee. So it's, all, it's that high all through the trail? Yeah, yep. Member the governor, when we opened, when it was finished, mm -hmm. he was here, the governor, Governor Inslee, mm -hmm. and uh, so we welcomed him on, the, on that top trail. It's a beautiful, beautiful job that they did. Yeah, it's a great trail, and like Daryl said too, it, it, it opens the opportunity up to extend the Green River Trail north to 277th and beyond. There's, there's some some challenges in Kent um, with some private properties that you know in order to make that connection with Kent but it still gets us the opportunity to get you know north to 277th to the to the north city limits so and it also acts as a uh, as a feeding area for the juvenile salmon yeah there's some off-river mm -hmm. you know habitat in there mm -hmm. Any other questions for Jamie? <clears throat> Thank you, Jamie. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we're looking at the public art selection. Here comes Daryl. <laughs> and my two cohorts. I'm pleased to be here tonight on the public art selection process and I'm joined with um, Nancy Colson from the Arts Commission who is part of the subcommittee as well as um, Peter Requiem and he's the proposed artist for this site. You're going to get a chance to see some of his previous work as well as um, the vision for what he has for this site. A little bit of background, um, we're kind of going to swing between all of us here. But um, the subcommittee is the method that the city has used for many years for selecting um, public art. And um, this project has been one that we've um, been looking at for quite a long time. One of the goals was to open up the Big Daddy's Her property to Les Gove and make it look more park-like so people know there's actually a park in behind there. Um, we're going to go over kind of some of the call that uh, For Culture, King County For Culture was the ones who organized the call to artists. There were 34 artists that we gleaned through, the subcommittee did. A couple of those are here. Lisa Russell from the Park Board, right there. Wayne Fanshear from the Park Board. And I don't know if there's anybody else here was on that committee, but... Um, Wayne, yeah, he's back there. Um, <laughs> staff, Allison Hyde managed the project, and Julie Kruger is involved in all the cool stuff we do in our parks, so she's here as well. So we'll get started on the, on the process here. So it's to be located on Lescope's property, um, right off of Auburn Way. I, I see the oval there where it's intended. I want to make sure I don't jump into yours. <laughs> and um, so this is the process. It was a $125,000 budget for this project. It's been carried over a couple of years. Each year the city puts thirty dollars to $40,000 into public art. We haven't done a piece the last two years. It's in the capital facilities plan, so it's a budgeted item. The call was to Washington and Oregon artists. I think we had a few others come in that weren't from there potentially. 32 applications. The subcommittee included Patricia Cosgrove from the museum, Greg Watson, Jan Jensen, Nancy Colson, and Wayne and Lisa. And then the, art, the um, consultants who are working on our Let's Go Master Plan, um, Guy Michelson was there as well, and Kevin Snyder was involved. 
the voting members were the non-staff people that actually um, gave the thumbs up, thumbs down on all 32 artists, the 32, as well as the rest of the process. So we narrowed it down. I have to remember when I'm supposed to it's stop. It's your turn. Okay, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, so we, the committee, which consisted of all the people that Daryl just mentioned, um, thought a lot about the site and where it is and how people might interact with it. And uh, we wanted to have something that would be an iconic presence that would, um, as Daryl said, indicate the presence of the park from Auburn Way uh, to be a, something that people, um, would say, wow, or that's interesting, or let's stop and have our picture taken with that. Um, and that was the, some of the guiding principles, that it would be fun, that it would be whimsical, um, that it could be touchable, that people could walk around it, touch it, whatever it turned out to be, that it would invite that kind of connection from people, and that it would connect to a broad audience. Kids would love it any age. Uh, would be engaged by this um, this iconic art piece and also that it would be something that could be replicated uh, whatever it turned out to be that that could be kind of a theme maybe for the park it could be duplicated in other locations on a smaller scale and that um, sort of idea so um, the committee uh, had a very um, active interaction um, with the artist when he made his presentations. Uh, nobody was afraid to speak their mind, and uh, we had some um, healthy differences of opinion, but in the end, um, we all um, agreed on what the recommendation would be to the Arts Commission, and um, our recommendation was accepted by the Arts Commission, and, um, and now this is the presentation from the Arts Commission to the Council Planning Committee, and it'll be up to the City Council from here on. So we're gonna give you a, a good overview of, of what we did, and the artist is here, and he's next. Okay, well thanks for having me this evening, getting a chance to meet you folks and talk a little bit about what I do. Um, I'm, a, I'm an artist, I've do, been doing public art projects as my primary emphasis for over 30 years. And I've done a lot of projects in the Puget Sound region as well as other parts of the country. And the goal is always to create something that has relevance um, to that particular site. So the projects are all completely different because the environment is different, the people who use it are different, the uh, architecture, the landscape, all of those things factor into uh, the design process. So I'm just going to show you a couple of examples of some previous work to give you an idea of how I approach things. This particular piece is called Bucket Brigade, is uh, for a fire station in Roswell, Georgia. And so it, the sculpture itself represents uh, sort of a, st a stop motion animation of the motion of throwing a bucket of water onto a fire. And it's, sorry, no, that's okay. It, has, it incorporates light. Um, you can see the <coughs> glow coming out of those buckets to represent the water inside. So the piece is functional as sort of a beacon at night as people um, pass the fire station. Um, the next piece is at, at the Pierce County Skills Center in Puyallup, um, which is a, essentially a, a trade school extension of the uh, Bethel uh, School District. High school kids can go here and take classes on any number of trade-related um, subjects in an effort to teach them uh, skill that they can go out and, and find employment with. So my sculpture is called Hit or Miss. And it's a giant hammer, it's 15 feet tall, that sort of stands in for all of the various tools that, are, that would be used to learn a new skill. So it's, a, it's not specific to any one skill, but sort of an iconic uh, tool. And the, the title suggests that nobody's perfect. You know, The process of learning a new skill has its ups and downs. And so you can see there's a, a bent nail in the front there. And the, bent, the uh, nails function as benches, so it becomes sort of a little gathering place right in the middle of the campus. Another fire station project in Albuquerque. Um, Albuquerque, well, New Mexico in general has a long history of rocketry. And 
so this seemed like a fun way to approach this this particular call uh, to create for a fire station to create a rocket ship in the guise of an Albuquerque fire engine so it's painted with the exact same uh, color scheme and uh, gold leaf lettering and so on that you would see on their fire fire uh, fire engines and it's really a metaphor for the rapid response capabilities of a fire department it's a little bit um, sort of futuristic and meant to be serious on one level, but also to have a sense of humor. And uh, coincidentally, I've been doing fire station <laughs> projects. Um, this, one, <laughs> this one is in Seattle. Um, it's fire station number nine, which uh, <clears throat> is in Fremont, just, uh, just right near the Aurora Bridge, on the, just on the north end of the Aurora Bridge. And the station number nine is is important because at some point many many years ago the firefighters at this station adopted the old ever ready battery logo as their mascot and you might remember that it's a, a very prominent graphic design of a black cat very stylized black cat with a lightning bolt tail jumping through the number nine so I knew I when I first met with the firefighters and started investigating what I was going to do for this project they, they kept coming back to this idea of how much they loved that cat so I figured in some way the cat would, would be the jumping off point for my concept. And eventually I built this 20 foot long, uh, three dimensional black cat with a lightning bolt tail that looks like it's stepping off of the roof, maybe you know, getting ready to jump onto a fire engine to answer a call. <laughs> and it has, it has um, glass eyes with LED lights inside. So at night you see the, the whole face, uh, you see the eyes glowing in the dark. And one last thing I'll say about it is it has heads on, faces on both sides. So that whenever you're passing the station, if you look up, the cat is always looking at you. <laughs> so, and I think this is the last example. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. This is in Kent at the Willis Street Gateway, and it's called Big Corn. <clears throat> um, it's meant to represent the, the history of the Kent Valley as a rich agricultural land, and which is hardly visible these days. It's been so developed. Um, but I wanted to sort of pay homage to the, the agriculture, the agricultural history of the, of the valley in a sort of cartoon way. These are 17 and a half foot tall corn stalks and each, each of the corn cobs is about two feet long. So it's quite big. Well, Nancy's gonna give a little reasoning for how the committee <laughs> went through the crow process, and I think has actually a little poetry for us, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we looked at a number of proposals from um, Peter, and this image, this, this crow standing with a French fry in his mouth and his head cocked a little the way crows do um, when someone's around looking at them, really caught our attention and our, our fancy, if you will. And it has the scale and the size, and we had all kinds of um, reactions, really positive reactions to this, this figure. A um, couple things I just wanted to kind of, we talked about crows a lot, and um, they, are, they are truly have become iconic urbanites city dwellers and um, they are in here and in many places they're kind of the unofficial cleanup crew for the town that's one of their one of their functions and I wanted to read just a little bit about crows my uh, my son-in-law is a middle school science teacher and his class of sixth seventh and eighth graders made this book about everything that lives in Washington plants animals reptiles fish and birds and about crows the student who wrote this one said, as far as their diet goes, crows are omnivorous and eat whatever is available, such as insects, spiders, and snails, eggs, nuts, fruit, vegetables, smaller animals, and snakes. However, they will happily feast from animal carcasses and trash cans. They are also known to drop hard-shelled nuts from above onto roads for cars to crack as they drive, and then they come down to eat. Crows are the most adaptable and most intelligent of birds. They are very social birds with a distinct call, as we all know. 
we one of the things we liked about the um, the image uh, and the proposal that uh, Peter came up with is the uh, reference because of the French fry in the crow's mouth is for those who know it was there that's going to be a reference to the drive-in restaurant for the people who don't know that that was ever there it still works because it, it's it's an iconic image of a crow doing his cleanup job in the city now Peter's going to talk a little more about his approach to you know, constructing it and how, how it's going to work and all of that sort of thing but I have as Daryl said just happened to have a piece of poetry and I heard Mr. Baggett read some poetry the other day and so this is called the business of crows by a man named Joseph Green. One of them has a discarded half pint milk carton by its pinched top and is banging it on the sidewalk. Hopping with it, dragging it along, he hefts it with his beak and swings it against the concrete. Then he pauses to inspect his work, to adjust his grip before picking up the carton and smacking it down again. Every time he hits the sidewalk with the empty box, it makes a flat, satisfying plop. Perhaps that's all the crow wants, the hollow report he gets for his labor confirming its emptiness. As for me, I have stopped on my way back to my office to watch a crow's involvement with a milk carton. Sunlight filtering through bare trees stains the bird a dark blue that slips to black like secret ink and makes sense only as his feathers move. What could possibly be more important than this? I have no further excuses. So, Peter. That's good, I like that one. Yeah. <laughs> well, so I'll just say a, a few words about the, the sculpture itself. It's gonna be, uh, there's another slide that shows sort of the relative scale <coughs> in a minute, but this gives you some idea of it. I want it to be really big because the, there's a lot of traffic flying past <coughs> there. I want people to be able to see it and, and be able to recognize instantly what it represents. Um, but without being real, uh, very realist about it in terms of you know precision sculpting of a form, I want it to have a little bit more of an abstract uh, appearance because it's a it's a fabricated mechanical looking um, crowbot, I suppose. <laughs> um, and it's big, so it's approximately 12 feet high to the top of the head. The French fry box could also be used as seating, so there's a little bench or maybe even a little, you could sit on it and eat your lunch there. Um, the finish would be a powder coated finish that's very durable, or more durable than wet paint. Um, and in a semi-gloss black finish, it will actually reflect some of the colors around it, so some of the, it will pick up some of the green from the grass and the blue from the sky and so on. Um, and I'm also proposing that, like the black cat that you saw a moment ago, that it have uh, glass eyes with LED lights inside so that at night the eyes will glow. And then I'm also proposing that we put some up lights in the ground surrounding this thing so that the sculpture itself is at least partially illuminated um, <coughs> so that it, it takes on a presence and also a function at night. Um, and also incorporating lighting does reduce the, the uh, vandalism uh, potential somewhat. Um, the, you can, could you go back one, Daryl? You can maybe see a little bit here. I'm suggesting that we may need to create a little bit of a plaza area underneath it, some kind of a paving, or Daryl was mentioning maybe a, a Synthetic grass Synthetic or something. Grass, mm -hmm. Something underneath there. So because otherwise, from a maintenance point of view, it'd be very difficult to mow around it. So to keep that area clear underneath. Um, but it would have a substantial concrete footing underneath it. So yeah. Any questions about that? Yeah. On the tail end, will people or children be able to climb on that? I think people would be able to get onto the tail of it a little bit, but it's just a slope tail, and it's, the tail will actually touch the ground yeah. because there has, just structurally, there has to be a, a third uh, mounting point between the two legs and the, to sort of triangulate it. 
but it would be a very gentle slope, and I don't think it's possible to climb onto it completely. That's just my only concern. Mm -hmm. The uh, the box. Mm -hmm. I I looked at that box and I said, God, it'd be great if there was a park bench where people could eat their lunch. And mm -hmm. you did say that, but looking at it, the uh, seating part looks like it's going down this way rather than. Well, I think maybe it's just a question of scale because I envision the top of the box being only a couple feet above the ground. That the largest flat surface of that box is only oh, about so two feet high. It won't be eaten. You couldn't uh, have an eating area there. Like, like no, that. I wasn't really proposing a more a, of a bench a, than a table eating area per se. Just suggesting that people would probably naturally sit there and and use that use it that way. Okay. Now is that. Seating on both sides? No, I'm suggesting the seating, just sitting on the top of it as if it's. Oh, sitting on top of right. it. Right. Oh, that, and then the <coughs> other would be for your feet then, or whatever. Well, those are the folds in the box. Oh, it's not okay. A, that drawing doesn't give you enough detail, clearly. Okay. But I'm, but I'm just talking about the, the top surface <coughs> of the box being the seating area. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Sure. Any other questions? So the process from here is we have an ordinance prepared that, author, that would authorize the mayor to enter a contract with Peter upon your concurrence next week at City Council. So we'll have it before you next Tuesday. I think Monday's a holiday. So um, we appreciate um, the process and I think it's really, I know that the committee that was on it really appreciated um, being involved in it as well. Exactly. Council yeah. Member Brown has a question. Yeah, the structure that's uh, adjacent to the fries <coughs> Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm just guessing, but is that uh, paying homage to maybe a drive-in? Is that what that exactly. was? Exactly. As a matter of fact, that is a relic of the drive-in, the, the drive-in restaurant that stood on that site. That right. was the Big that was the awning where the cars pulled in. Okay. So the framework. So it's is the actual. In, it's the actual. Yeah. One. It's the yeah. actual one yeah. in its actual yeah. place. It hasn't been moved. Oh, that's cool. And um, yeah. I I found that a very intriguing aspect of the site, and some wanted to sort of incorporate that in some way, at least conceptually. So mm -hmm. the crow and the fry is sort of tied into that drive-in. Mm -hmm. Also, member Holman. And prior to Big Daddy's, that was Rolf's Triple X. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. Just. Also, <laughs> member DeCarsey. Um, I really like the, the plaza um, presentation. I think that really enhances the, the piece itself. And like Councilman Blows is saying, it gives people a chance to kind of meander around it and, and uh, congregate around it. So my question is, um, the fabrication installation period, how long is it going to take? Uh, there's a, the fabrication itself will take me about three months. And the installation is a matter of days. Um, but before the fabrication phase, there's, there needs to be some fleshing out of the structure and how I'm going to make this thing and consul consultation with my structural engineer. Mm -hmm. So that's all part of my process. And that, that can take a few months also, depending mm -hmm. on people's schedules. So, but realistically, um, from the time, typically from the time I sign a contract for a commission, it's about a year. Okay. Thank you. Member Trout Manuel. You know, I really like this concept because every morning I get up, there's Hundreds, and I mean hundreds <laughs> of these crows all over my That'd be a yard. murder of crows. <laughs> yeah, right? that's what we're up on. The, <laughs> the, I, I'm still coming back to the tail and the wings. Uh -huh. According to this, how how wide are they? Um, you know, I'm I'm concerned about safety here. Right. And uh, on this on that photo, it looks like the wings are pretty pointed. And um, can the kids also climb on those and jump off? Well, <laughs> That's the, you know, I think, I think this, this is part of the reason why I have to go to the next phase of really <clears throat> fine-tuning things, is to um, really look at how those shapes come together. There won't be sharp edges and there won't be sharp points because that's not <clears throat> safe, obviously. <coughs> I've, you can probably see from this particular image versus the other one, I've already tapered the tail even more so, so that it, there's less surface area to climb on. 
Okay. Um, that that one, the, the, that sketch looks more like a slide sort of situation. Okay. Um, but safety is, is always a concern of mine, and when I put work out in public places, I expect to be responsible and design it in a way that it's, you know, it's not a hazard to people. But I would anticipate a selfie stick in a family of three or whatever right. being on the tail of it or whatever. So we wanted it to be interactive, yeah. but I don't think we want it to be a slide. So there's going to be right. some engineering involved Never to make it work. Never underestimate these the, kids. The, uh, <laughs> yeah. Our children, because they will find Believe a way. Believe me, he knows. <laughs> <laughs> so may I add, uh, I just want to say that, you know, once all the discussion was done, both at the committee level, all the participants on the committee, and the Arts Commission itself, it was a unanimous vote in both places and, and lots of smiles. People really loved this. I love the, what Peter came That's up Member with. Member Pelosa. Well, uh, we are Crow, in the Crow country. Yes, we are. Because on 15th, mm -hmm. they all come in and by the Emerald Downs, the, all those trees and the side, they just yeah. migrate. So this is a perfect theme for, for Auburn. Yeah. Perfect. Um, regarding the platform that was suggested, mm -hmm. full grass, I think, would be more maintenance than either solid concrete or um, pavers. I, I think that might be true. It's going to require some investigation on my part and, yeah. and some discussion yeah. with Daryl and others about the best solution. I would, I would opt more for solid concrete because pavers, dirt gets in the cracks, the joint, you know, where they joint, because I have those in my, in my patio, and I know all about moss and, and weeds and, and power washing, so. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Good job. Good job. And, sure and thank you beautiful. for the uh, thank you for mission. All the hard work you got. Bob. I was going to invite them up. So yeah. Oh yeah. <clears throat> you can. Uh, King County uh, Draft Comprehensive Solid Waste Management Plan. Nate Moorhead and Dorian Waller from King County Solid Waste. Yes, um, so as, as the council knows, I'm on the uh, Metropolitan Solid Waste Management Advisory Committee. And so this has been, this comprehensive uh, plan has been in the works over a year, and it is very complex, and it's very, very important. So I just, I suggested to Joan that we set this up on a study session so that you all will get the benefit of some good comprehensive discussion from King County. Thank you. Thanks. Technological difficulties. Hi, I'm Meg Moorhead, Strategy Communications and Performance Manager for King County Solid Waste. Um, I'm here to talk to you about a plan. Is it not working? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, about a plan that is under uh, public review right now, and it's a it's a plan that will guide the future of our regional solid waste system for the next six to twenty years, and it is not just a King County plan guiding our actions, but also a plan done on behalf of our 37 partner cities. Auburn and 36 other cities are, uh, work with us to develop the plan. Um, only the cities of Milton and Seattle are not part of our King County system. Um, so it's a policy roadmap for what we do in terms of um, disposing waste, recycling, um, transferring waste. The goal is to have something that works for everyone, provides a policy framework for us all to work together towards common goals. Um, the plan's required by state law, and it's also required under interlocal agreement between the cities and the county. Um, it's currently 
out for public review went out on J January 8th and will the public review period closes on March 8th. That's 60 days, that's twice the uh, review time that's required by state law. So we're really looking for public comments at this point from the cities and other members of the community. Our last plan was adopted in 2001. So it's been a long time in the making to come up with a new plan. Um, and it's been through a very extensive review process so far with our two advisory committees, our um, Solid Waste Advisory Committee and our Metropolitan um, Advisory Committee with our municipal partners. It has both, I will hold it up, both the plan is out for review, which is all of the policies, but also a draft environmental impact statement. So both things have the opportunity for comment. Council Member Pelosa. And uh, I, I brought one of those back from the last, so we have one on our mail counter. Okay. It's like the one she showed. Okay. So some places that I go, um, folks don't, oh, it didn't quite, some places I go, pe people don't quite know what the uh, parts of the regional system are. And so here, this is, um, we serve about 1.4 million people in both incorporated and unincorporated King County. Um, the county is a wholesale service provider. We don't provide curbside garbage pickup. That's done by our um, private haulers under contract to cities or under state regulation in the unincorporated areas, or that's done by a couple of cities directly by themselves. So what we do is we operate eight ur urban transfer stations that's where the uh, collection trucks take the garbage that's collected curbside and consolidate it for transfer up to our county landfill outside of Maple Valley. That's the last active landfill in King County. Um, so we also have nine closed landfills that the county monitors and maintains uh, for, for public health and environmental quality. Cities, what do you do? Well, you provide the contracts or direct curbside collection um, services, and you also work with the county and other regional partners on recycling policies and programs. And then we rely as part of this regional um, system on private sector participation, not just the curbside haulers, but also um, we have processing of recyclables and organics, and that's all done by the private sector. So it's a combination, city, county, public, private, um, solid waste system that is covered in the plan. There are six major elements in the plan and these are all required under state law. We're looking at um, just basically how, what's, what are the pieces of our system, how do we forecast and evaluate it. Really the three big uh, issues that we've been focusing public comment on are the recycling or here called sustainable materials management. Uh, the transfer choices in the system, and then also disposal of garbage. This is the first time that the county's been able to bring in a couple of initiatives that have uh, been undertaken since 2001. Back in 2001, some um, issues such as climate protection weren't as strongly on the public um, radar screen as they are today and this plan has policies that allow us to consider consider climate protection as part of our decision making in the future. It also has policies that allow us to consider equity and social justice which has come in as a strong county initiative um, that's also been supported by the cities. Excuse me, um, how is that social justice uh, expressed? What is yeah, you know, this is all about, do, are we fairly providing services to all um, areas of our service area and all members of our community? And um, so we don't want to um, unfairly disadvantage any one community by, for example, concentrating all facilities in that place. We also don't want to unfairly disadvantage uh, communities by not placing facilities close enough for people to be able to easily access them. Um, you'll see later we have uh, financial policies that um, continue our practice um, of having the same rates all the way across our regional system. 
but allow us options for having differential rates if, if um, that's a choice that's made. And how many languages do you have all of your material? Okay, these materials are, and we'll get into some of our outreach materials later, but um, uh, the outreach materials, we've got a survey, for example, on our website that's in Spanish. We also have handouts that are available on the website for any city to download or that are being handed out at all of our transfer stations that are in both English and Spanish. Um, there are, uh, there's, uh, notification on the website that if anyone needs interpretation at one of our open houses that we conduct, if they call us in advance, we could have interpreters there available. Plus, interpretation is available if they call us. We can connect them up with interpretation services through the county. So let's start with recycling. Um, or sustainable materials management, and our, our regulators, the Department of Ecology, they're the ones that approve the plan, and they use this term sustainable materials management, which is trying to get at the full life cycle of the materials. And the, surprisingly, we've been working with our advisory committees um, on a goal of 70% recycling, and that's recycling 70% of all of the materials that come through our regional system, both um, in the cities and in the county. Right now, we're only at 52%. Um, and this 70% interim goal has not been adopted formally in the past, so this will be the first time that our comprehensive plan includes it. Why do we think that we can get to 70%? Well, if you just look at the component that's landfilled today, about 70% of what's in the land, going to the landfill could be recycled, composted easily or potentially recyclable if the, if the markets uh, were to be a little bit stronger. So already we're landfilling a lot of material that has economic value. And the plan is, uh, presents a menu of actions that different jurisdictions can take to achieve different goals. It emphasizes preventing waste and reusing uh, products so that they don't come into the regional system to begin with. Also includes recycling and composting as goals. It, it has tools uh, like education, which is widely used to promote recycling in our region. Also incentives like grants that are available to cities for recycling programs. Uh, mandates like uh, pre or banning the disposal of yard waste in garbage is a, an example of a mandate that's available to the different jurisdictions. And then infrastructure improvements, like providing uh, recycling at our regional transfer stations. It's a menu of actions. It provides all the jurisdictions lots of choices. It doesn't mandate that we all do all of these actions. We got a lot of feedback from our cities that said that there, everybody's at a different starting point and has different needs. You know, Algona is currently at 30-something percent recycling in their jurisdiction, whereas other jurisdictions like Bellevue and others are up above 60 percent. So they're both at different starting points. We have communities that are strongly commercially oriented, like Tukwila uh, with South Center. And then we've got others that are largely single-family residential. And so they felt that they needed to have the flexibility to choose from this menu the things that work best for their jurisdiction. Council Member Pelosa. So uh, are we at 40 some percent recycling? Um, City of Auburn? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I can define that out. We have. We're, uh, yeah, we're, we're in like the uh, probably right around the 50 percent when okay. we average our, the haulers together. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I should know it for every city, but I. Sometimes well, I, 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 <laughs> I thought it was high 40s or... Yeah. Or. Right. right. And, and, and so the advantage of this approach is it gives lots of flexibility. The disadvantage is if we have a goal of 70% recycling and everybody is doing their own thing without agreeing to a time frame, then we don't know exactly when we're going to reach that 70%. So let's talk about um, the next section, which is transfer of the waste, and these are largely the, the county's transfer stations. And um, 
the structure of the draft plan, the public draft plan, is a little bit different than past plans where um, recommendations were made in the transfer and the disposal chapters. In this public review draft, we're asking for public input on which choices we should recommend. So in transfer, you'll see three choices that we'll discuss in a minute um, about the transfer services in the Northeast County. Uh, just to give you a sense of our different stations and how much material is moving through each of those stations in a given year, here in 2016, these are all of the stations that the county operates with um, thousands of tons kind of on the vertical scale. You can see Bow Lake is our biggest station. It's the one that you see just east of the highway as you come through uh, Tukwila on I-5. Um, it takes about a third of the county's waste is, is uh, consolidated for transfer up to the landfill from that station. But then you can see we've got a number of other stations that handle a lot of waste. Houghton in Kirkland, that's our northeast area, is the second largest our number of tons being handled and that's also one of our biggest growth areas. And then you can see uh, Algona now called South <coughs> County, we're in the midst of redeveloping a, a larger modern station there and then a number of other um, stations. We've been undergoing a modernization program uh, because a lot of these originally were built in the 1960s. They had open sides, short roofs. Um, that means that the roofs are too short for modern e were too short for modern equipment. The open sides meant that um, it's harder to control noise and odor. Um, there uh, is, wasn't compaction with the old stations and compaction allows you to <coughs> have fewer trips, uh, truck trips to the landfill because you're packing more into each truck. Recycling options were sometimes um, a problem. So here at the modernized station, this is our new Hectoria station outside of Bellevue. Um, we've, uh, we've, this modernization program is for customer convenience, having a facility big enough for everybody to be able to get through quickly without having the commercial traffic interfere with the self-haul traffic, uh, faster unloading, more recycling choices, compaction, which can reduce truck trips out of the station by a third, and then sustainable building design and operations. So these are done according to energy efficient standards with renew reused um, building materials so that we're really making these more efficient to operate over the long haul. But there's a big question. Um, modernization has either been conducted or is underway in almost every part of the county system except for the very last part, which is the northeast area, the area in green up here, kind of northeast of Kirkland. It's the last one where the final decision to modernize the station has not been made. The South County station's already underway in the city of Algona. Uh, so Northeast is the very last station. So the question is still available. Should we just stick with Houghton, the old Houghton station as it is, without the recycling and compaction and uh, you know noise and odor containment within an enclosed building? Do we build a new Northeast station, which had been recommended back in um, 2007 through a transfer plan, and that would allow all the modern conveniences to be available in a Northeast area? Or do we do some combination, like maybe keep the old Houghton station for self-haulers and build a smaller commercially oriented station somewhere else in the Northeast? Um, we're looking for public input on each of these. Um, by the time we get the public input, um, we hope to come down to one solution before it goes to the county council for a decision. Okay, disposal. Similar to the transfer station, um, we're offering options here for public input instead of making one recommendation. We have a landfill, a local landfill we've been using for 50 years. It's been a great local cost-effective solution for the region. We collect landfill gas and, and uh, refine it into renewable energy. Um, but it's the currently permitted capacity there is going to run out. We predict right now it's going to run out in 2028. And this kind of shows the, uh, you know, how quickly we are going to work uh, through the existing capacity and so 
it's um, under our interlocal agreements, the county is responsible for providing disposal services to the cities and, and the unincorporated area through 2040. So we have a gap between the, uh, the disposal um, in this current cell of the landfill and what we need to provide through the interlocal agreements. Um, you know, uh, so we have three different options that we're offering in the plan for um, <coughs> meeting that or filling that gap. One is to develop further capacity at Cedar Hills. Um, we're going to be monitoring and maintaining that landfill for many years to come because we're regulated by the state and federal regulations to keep an, our eye on it. So the question is, should we spend some money to build some more capacity and squeeze some more value out of the landfill uh, before we move to something else? And that has the advantage of, of being um, having lower cost also, more predictability because we've been doing it for 50 years. It would require, it has some challenges too. It would require some redoing of our permitting to go higher than we currently are allowed. Um, we need to continue to be good neighbors to our landfill uh, residents adjacent to the landfill. Um, we need to um, relocate the buildings. You see buildings kind of, there's a picture there of our landfill. There are buildings that are sitting on top of um, areas that are permitted for refuse. And so we would need to move those buildings so that we could use that area for refuse. So that's the further developed Cedar Hills option. We could also do what our, some of our regional neighbors do, which uh, City of Seattle, Snohomish County, they export their waste by rail to out of county landfills. And so it's a, it's a proven alternative. Um, several regional landfills have sufficient capacity for our waste for many, many years to come. Um, it would move a significant part of the county's um, operations to the private sector because typically you would co have one co uh, competitively bid contract and that contract would provide for the transfer of waste from trucks to rail cars and then the long haul transport on rail of those containers, and then the unloading at the far end and disposal at an out of county landfill. So you'd have a, a one contract with all sorts of components to it. Um, it has, you know, to do that option, we'd have to modify our transfer stations so that they were rail ready. Things like compaction make a difference. You'd be sending fewer uh, containers if you compact them than if you didn't. Um, we would need lead time to get the, the contracts and the division operations in order. And you have issues like rail capacity and weather related uh, rail disruptions that would need to be contended with. So, Council Member Holman. Yes, thank you, Chair. Could you provide me with some sort of comparison between what we're paying in King County per ton and what Seattle pays per ton, or any other comparison between the two. How much more expensive is it to put it on a rail and send it to Oregon? Um, in the next slide, you'll see. <laughs> um, because cost time. clearly is, you know, cost isn't the only factor that we look at. We also look at how does it support our regional recycling rates. Uh, what's the environmental benefit in terms of energy production or, uh, you know, reduction of environmental impacts. But cost is clearly important to our ratepayers, and so the next slide will kind of show where that's at. Council Member Troutman. You answered part of the, mm -hmm. my question about the rail. Yeah. Um, how far or where would our, our garbage go to from, from Algona and what's the closest rail? Yeah. Um, the, you know, there are a number of intermodal facilities um, in the region where you transfer the truck um, containers to the rail. Um, one example is in South Seattle, the Argo um, facility. Um, the, on the far end, um, there are, it's usually in eastern Oregon, eastern Washington, the kind of arid rural um, areas have, um, I think there are four or five landfills. Um, that are within three or four hundred miles um, that are reachable by rail. Well, would that add an extra cost on our citizens? 
Y yeah, um, you'll, you'll see the cost in the next um, slide, and because you're, you have that extra cost of transport, there is that. Yeah. Council Member Brown, you have a question. Yeah, um, you actually answered the question. Uh -huh. oh, okay, okay. <laughs> And then a third option um, is building a waste to energy facility. And we had a consultant look at this. They, there are several different technologies. The, the technology they thought was a best fit for our situation was what's called a mass burn facility. It basically um, burns the waste, uh, produces electricity, um, and um, reduces the um, volume of what goes in by 90% and the weight of what goes in by about 75%. Um, it has an advantage of uh, potentially increasing our recycling rate by as much as 2% because you can recover metal from ash. Um, Does that uh, burning of, of that garbage and trash, does that result in an environmental problem? You know, um, you can read about that in the draft environmental impact statement, uh, which concludes that um, we have state um, regulations about air quality emissions, and facilities that meet those state emission standards are not expected to have significant adverse environmental effects. One of the byproducts of, of the uh, energy is methane gas? Um, they, they, that's the landfill, the landfill gas that we collect at the landfill and refine to, uh, into um, renewable natural gas. Um, what they're doing here is they're burning it and recovering the, the heat to create electricity. Yeah, so it's a different kind of electricity, you know, so, or different kind of energy recovery. Uh, so some of the challenges, so you heard some of the benefits, you know, some of the challenges include facility siting, finding a 40-some acre site for this, um, cost, um, needing to guarantee a consistent quantity of feedstock to keep it running efficiently, um, having uh, possible shutdowns when uh, some waste can't um, go through the, the facility because it's either not burnable or you have to shut the facility down for maintenance. So you need to have um, a parallel export system is assumed to take the ash, which is, you know, 25% of the tons are going to come out as ash, and also the, the waste that can't be burned in the facility would be exported to an out-of-county landfill. Ash needs to be disposed in a, what they call a monofill, a special kind of landfill, and, and uh, so that needs to be taken into consideration, too. Um, with, the rail, with that rail component, it also has the rail capacity issues that, and the weather-related rail issues that you would see in an export solution. Okay, so you, you've been very eager to get to the costs, so let's, uh, let's show the costs. The, the lower line is the uh, cost of um, operating the landfill today, and then virtually right on top of it is the cost of adding um, <coughs> capacity there and getting the landfill to last what we think will be through about 2040. We're always adjusting, just so you understand, our business runs with the economy. So in good times, people buy a lot of stuff and throw away a lot of stuff, right? So we get lots of material <coughs> through our system, which means the price per unit is lower, right? In bad times, people hold on to their stuff, don't buy new things, and our uh, tons go down and so do our revenue. So, we're always adjusting the kind of expiration date of the landfill because it depends on the economy, how much stuff is showing up on our doorstep due to the economy. So the red line on the bottom is the estimate, that's the dollars per ton, and that's just the disposal component of our rate. Our rate's currently about um, one, well, it's exactly 134.59 per ton. Everybody pays the same. Uh, amount, and about 40 of that is uh, disposal cost at this point. So um, this is just, this is showing the total rate with these different alternatives, but just the uh, disposal component of it. 
So if you look at the green line, the question about export, we used for the sake of this plan an assumption that, that we would have an export system very similar to the city of Seattle's. That we would use the pricing that they managed to negotiate and have the same sort of um, components in terms of intermodal transfer and um, out of county landfill that they have. And you can see it's, it's higher than what using our existing landfill is and it increases with inflation which is how the uh, Seattle contract works. Council Member Brown, did you take a look at the Snohomish County model? Y yes, we did. And, um, and it's very similar sort of approach, you know, contract and put a lot of the risk of, you know, disruption, that sort of thing on the contract. Um, and, but we felt that the Seattle prices were a closer um, comparison to, to our metropolitan area prices. And then you can see um, the blue line on top represents the cost for waste energy. And um, you know, some people go, wow, why is it so different uh, when waste to energy has been a very successful uh, technology used in Europe and also elsewhere in the US, places like Florida. Well, some of the things that are unique to our region is that um, electricity is sold to offset some of the cost. Where do we get our electricity here? You know, very cheap hydropower. So, um, you know, other places like Florida, they're displacing oil or coal-fired um, plants that produce electricity. They're selling it into a high, high price energy market. Um, we don't have that high price market to offset the cost. Um, other things, uh, Florida has shallow groundwater, um, and so it doesn't have the landfilling option, so that's not as much of an option. Uh, so that some things that work in favor of um, this technology elsewhere don't quite have the same advantage. Like in Europe, you can use the ash for a building products, that sort of thing. Here in Washington State, that's not allowed. Um, you could do a a change in law to allow it, but right now it isn't. Uh, so some of those factors all um, come into play. Um, so they're not counterbalancing the cost of the the capital cost of the facility, which is really the biggest part of that cost. Councilmember Troutman. So Maggie, um, the green and the blue are what are going to be starting after 2028. Yeah. The, that's because you saw the earlier graph where we said we've got, we've built capacity already in our landfill that'll take us, we think, through 2028. So the green and the blue would just start after we filled up that capacity that we've already <laughs> built. And then, then it would step up to something else. Um, the, if we built um, extra ca new capacity at Cedar Hills to get us through 2040, we would still be at a point after that where we would need to find another alternative. It could be um, waste to energy, could be export, because um, the, the county has passed um, ordinances <coughs> saying we're not going to build a new landfill here in King County. So really once, whether we expand the landfill now or not, there will eventually be a choice to be made about what we do next on disposal. If we wait till 2040, we'll have a little bit more time to plan and, and see technological advancements. Bill, you have your work cut out for you for the next 10 years. <laughs> he's yeah. been a he's been a avid uh, a participant, a very active participant in our advisory committees, and we so much appreciate his voice he at the us table. Well informed. I, I I hope so. I'm sure that he does. We focused on recycling, transfer, and disposal choices, but I just want to point out we've got a couple more things going on in, in the plan, things like just policies around our existing system. One thing that we might want to point out is that um, it, the finance chapter does allow us to continue to uh, charge for our services the way we do today, which is almost all based on the per ton fee charged at our transfer stations. But it also gives us some other options, looking at uh, whether other components of the fee could be added to help um, account for increased recycling, which will reduce the number of units coming through our system um, and reduce our revenues. Also, 
um, allows us to consider a low income rate, which has been of long interest to the county. So, where are we at? Boy, this is one heck of a long process. 2016 is when we started working with our committees. Um, and we spent uh, more than a year uh, working with them to get to the plan to the point where the committee said, yes, it's ready for public review. And we're currently right in the middle of this uh, graphic in the 60-day public review period. It closes March 8th. Um, the state gets a concurrent review, but they get 120 days by state law. So um, they started their review at the same time as the public, but theirs will go on uh, twice as long as the public review. After we have both the public and the, the state input, then we'll revise the plan before submitting it to the uh, county council for adoption. Um, once it gets into the county council's hand, they have their own process to work their way through uh, we've been talking to them about uh, what exactly that process will be. It may be as late as early 2019 before they're able to play out the process. Once the county adopts it, then they pass it on to the cities for action, likely in early 2019, and you get 120 days. After the critical mass of cities act on it and approve, then the state gives final approval. One thing I'd like to mention is the later in the process you bring in um, c big concerns about the plan, the harder it is to get them addressed because, you know, once the county council acts and it goes to 37 cities for action, it's hard for any one city to say, oh, wait a minute, because we've got all these other um, jurisdictions that are have it under concurrent review. So, so now during the 60-day review period is really the, the best time to get your concerns on record, any issues, issues or support on record. How is the feedback uh, coming so far? Are you getting a lot of comments? You know, we, we are. Um, we just, you'll see, we just uh, completed three open houses. We had one um, north, east, and south. Um, we did it in the middle of the comment period so people would have a chance to do, read it, come and ask some questions, and then still have some time to write up their comments. We have a uh, website, and here's the web address for it, uh, where we've got a whole bunch of information, uh, links to the plans, to summaries, um, to um, information sheets. We've got videos there that describe short snippets about each of the major issues. There's an online survey that you can take to kind of tell us what you think. Uh, but most importantly, it's, there's a link to the email address where if you want to make formal written comments on either the plan or the EIS, there's your opportunity. Um, you don't have to go electronically. If you'd rather send a letter just by plain old US mail, we welcome that. And we've got uh, the online survey, over 200 respondents. and. Uh, so we're, we're getting pretty good input, but there's still a lot more opportunity. And here are the three um, open houses. It's a little late <laughs> for folks, but just because you didn't have uh, a chance to come to the open house doesn't mean that you can't go on our website or um, certainly any jurisdiction. We're happy to answer questions. So. Council Member Peloza. Great job. Thank you. Um, so now you guys know why I've been such an advocate of mattresses staying out of the landfill, and especially the box spring, because when they have these big old earth movers pushing that stuff down, two weeks later the springs pop back up again. <laughs> uh, and then trying to keep styrofoam and tires out of the landfill. So there's a lot and a lot of recycling opportunities yet to come. There are. Any other questions? <coughs> and, oh, Council Member. Not a question, just to thank you to uh, my colleague, Mr. Peloza. Everything I know about solid waste, I've learned from you. <laughs> well, I feed you guys solid waste every <laughs> month. I've noticed. <laughs> yeah, every month. I've been meaning to talk to you. Sort of thing. <laughs> um, also, uh, Joan here, she's 
she is sharp as a tack on solid waste. She knows what's going on. And uh, I've learned a lot from Joan. Um, so, Meg, Joan, thank you. Okay. I guess we're going to go back to the regular agenda, item C, which is the ordinance number 6670. slides or presentations but <laughs> <laughs> Good evening deputy mayor and council members I'm Amber Price engineering aide with community development and public works department Wait. franchise agreement number 12-41 for Zao Group LLC is for telecommunications facilities that are currently in the city's right-of-way. The current franchise agreement under ordinance number 6452 is set to expire on April 11th, 2018 and allows for one renewal term of five years. Upon review of the current agreement, city staff and ZAO have determined that the language still meets both parties' needs with only a minor amendment to update ZAO's contact information. Those changes are shown on page 36 of 201 of your agenda packet. The current agreement requires that ZAO obtains construction permits so that they can make repairs, upgrades, and improvements to their existing and future facilities. These permits are reviewed and approved and managed through the city's permitting process. Um, currently, there's a public hearing scheduled for this renewal on Tuesday, February 20th. I'd be happy to answer any questions on the agreement. Questions. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Okay, moving right along. Uh, item 3D. It's the uh, MPDES annual report and stormwater management program. Yes. Good evening, Council Good evening. Chair and Council Members. My name is Kim Carla. I'm the City Storm Drainage Engineer. And with me this evening, I have Chris Thorne, our uh, Water Quality Programs Coordinator, and we're going to talk about our stormwater management program plan and our 2017 annual report as uh, required through our NPDES permit. So Chris is going to lead us through a uh, PowerPoint presentation uh, that really encompasses both of those two subjects and into the uh, overview. And, uh, We'll answer any questions along the way or at the end that you may have. So, thank you. We don't have that presentation, do we? No, you do not have this presentation. So, it's it's pretty much just pictures. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so as Tim mentioned, I'm Chris Thorne with the City of Auburn uh, Community Development and Public Works Department. I'm the Water Quality Programs Coordinator for the, the Utilities Section. And we're here to talk about the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System phase two municipal stormwater permit issued to the city by the Department of Ecology. And this uh, permit requires that the city develop or submit an annual report uh, each year talking about what they have done in the previous year. Uh, and part of that is also to attach a stormwater management, pro stormwater management program plan, which outlines what we're going to be doing during the current year, so that's again why we're here. Uh, the permit requires in our stormwater management program plan that we have various elements to develop or that constitutes our stormwater program. These include public education and outreach, uh, public involvement and participation, illicit discharge, detection and elimination, uh, controlling runoff from development, redevelopment, and new construction, um, municipal operations and maintenance, and, and some other items like uh, compliance with total maximum daily loads and, and monitoring and assessment. So uh, just to kind of go over those elements, I'm going to be covering them both what, we're, what we've done last year, part of our annual report, and what we are going to be doing this year. So starting with public education and outreach, um, last year we had a very successful year. 
We uh, continued our spill kit program, which is conducted by ECOS, the Environmental Coalition of South Seattle. They go out to businesses in town and talk to the business uh, managers and operators about pollution prevention. Uh, they visited 107 businesses in Auburn uh, last year, and of those businesses, 43% of them spoke English as a second language. Um, that's a very good program that we really enjoy participating in because they can talk to a lot of people that we would have difficulty communicating with and provide information in languages that we don't really have resources to, to provide. So. Um, we continued our National Yard Care workshops. We held three workshops in the, the Lakeland Hills neighborhood. We reached 59 unique households. Um, we uh, continued our stewardship program through the Environmental Services Group. They had 33 volunteers help with uh, work at the environmental park, you know, plantings, maintenance, uh, pulling weeds, putting mulch down, that type of thing. Um, we participated in the Newspapers and Education uh, program with a, a coalition of regional municipalities and put out uh, a supplement on salmon and stormwater. And we continued our uh, water festival program. We, we sponsored 408 students from Lakeland Hills Elementary and Terminal Park Elementary to go to a, a one-day field trip. Um, to learn about water and storm water. Uh, so in the upcoming year, we're gonna be continuing the, the uh, spill kit program, the outreach to businesses, utilizing ECOS. Uh, we are starting a new school education program. So we are going to be uh, having professional pre presenters go and present in school classrooms in Auburn. Uh, so far, last I heard, we had 18 presentations scheduled. So uh, we think that that's going to be a very good program to get the education to the students. Um, Council Member Pelosa has a question. How about education to the uh, mother and father and grandparents? Uh, one thing that, that has uh, been shown is that when you teach the kids, they take that home and they talk about it at home with their parents, with their grandparents. So I think uh, we're going to be I'd highly recommend that you think about the adults. Mm -hmm. okay. Council Member Brown. Uh, yes, uh, Councilman uh, Plosa, I will tell you that uh, my kids, when they came home from school and they had been taught some issues of recycling and uh, we had to <laughs> judiciously recycle. Uh, they, the kids help uh, help enforce that within the house because they want to do the right thing and uh, they're thinking about their future. So I, I do agree. Materials for the parents would be good too. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. That's good to hear though. Yeah. Member Trump, uh, I'm on the Blue Ribbon Committee and uh, we've been working a lot with Jill DeRay's uh, uh, Hispanic community mm -hmm. and we just did a class they did a class to, uh, to teach their, the children's parents English, but then we followed up with uh, training. We did a CPR class. We had the parents and the children there to teach them about um, how to do CPR on an infant and then on an adult. So it's kind of you know nice also to do, like Mr. Bowles had said, uh, also teach the parents in, mm -hmm. in the second language. Okay. Uh, because that's the way they're going to, they don't normally read the material that's brought home. Yeah. So it would be nice to do an educational with uh, people with a second language. Okay. Council Member Pelosa. You know, a thought occurred to me, we have this new civic <coughs> program for adults to attend. Maybe we could add a little blurb on educating in the civic course that we've civic are now to me. I think that this would fit really nicely in there. And not all of our residents have school aged children out there, so Perfect. it might be good to, to reach true. that uh, that yeah. group. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm probably one of them. Yes. So. And and this this program is just one of the many things. I mean we will still be putting articles in the Auburn magazine and, 
and doing other outreach as necessary. This was just a, a new program that we were starting this year, and um, <coughs> I'm sure that you knew that it was going to be out there. Further questions? Okay. Um, another element of our stormwater management program is illicit discharge detection and elimination. Uh, a lot of that is responding to illicit discharges, anything from spills, <coughs> uh, illicit connections. Um, another part of that is keeping our stormwater mapping up to date. So a big portion of it is our asset management program. We have a crew of uh, two field staff and, and other office staff working to keep our storm storm maps up to date. Uh, we're still working on that. And last year they covered approximately 15% of the city, bringing those areas up to date. Um, and as far as uh, responding to reports of illicit discharges, we had 48 reports last year that we responded to. Um, most of those are vehicle accident related incidents. Um, and in 2018, we will continue with the inventory process and we'll continue to uh, respond to reports as necessary for the illicit discharges. No, 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 no. Okay. Okay. Um, further element of our stormwater program is controlling runoff from new development, redevelopment, and construction sites. So that covers everything from having ordinance uh, to regulate development, having a storm drainage manual uh, that outlines how development is to occur and manage storm water, uh, the requirements for storm ponds for low impact development, uh, erosion control on construction sites, the inspections, the review, all of that sort of stuff is covered. Uh, in 2017, we reviewed 232 site plans and for proposed developments, and we had 105 sites that we inspected during construction. So uh, that uh, will continue on into the next, uh, next year. Uh, we're required to have a municipal operations and maintenance uh, stormwater element to our stormwater management program plan. And that includes inspections and maintaining the storm system. In 2018, we uh, were required, or 2017, we were required to complete a four-year process to inspect our entire system of catch basins. Mm -hmm. And so we completed that. Once uh, we do the inspections, if there's maintenance that's required, we have six months to do that maintenance. So we're currently uh, finishing up the maintenance that we found when we did inspections. Uh, starting in August of last year, we were required to go to a two-year inspection cycle. So we have to inspect all of our catch basins in two years. And we currently have about 9,700 catch basins in the city. Um, let's see, going beyond that, uh, where we are right now, we are uh, working towards adopting our stormwater management program plan. We are beginning the public uh, review process today. Uh, and on March 5th, we will be back for a public hearing on the, on the uh, stormwater management program plan. And then on March 19th, uh, we will be coming back with a resolution to adopt and then submit to Ecology by March 31st. And, and one thing that I, I realize now I neglected to say was our stormwater management or our stormwater permit is a five year permit. It is actually scheduled, was scheduled to end this year, but the state has extended it for a year. So it will not be, so we have another year. And what that means is that our stormwater management plan that we had last year pretty much has just carried over for another year without any new requirements. And that date is August. Yep. That's the magic date for the NPDES permit is August, essentially August 1 for us. So it's kind of confusing. It doesn't end with the calendar year. So it's a little bit of overlap there. Mm -hmm. yes. so. Another yeah. suggestion just for outreach uh, as, as president of a, a homeowner association. Uh, 
I would I would think that this kind of information that you've got here electronically would be good that they should share. Mm -hmm. And I will, sh if I can get a copy of this, I will be more than happy to share this with my neighbors. Okay. Uh, anybody else would like a copy of this? I have I have their annual plan, which. I think this presentation, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words. I think this is really a good presentation that the people could relate to. Okay. And I've got all their email. Mm -hmm. It's a nice looking blue heron. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Council so. Member Brown. Yes, I, I just uh, want to say how much I appreciated the, the information, the presentation, and was very impressed with the answers to question 20. And uh, the kind of response the city makes as a new city council member, I just have to say that uh, there's a lot that goes on that most of us don't recognize. And just want to acknowledge that work. And I know there must be a lot that goes into it, but thank you. Thank you. Hey, you guys don't, probably don't know this. Regional Water Quality <laughs> Committee right here. So she'll be really studying about all this in DPDS. Okay, I have a couple of questions. Yes, sir. Looking at the annual report, yes, sir. You, you talk about 10 hotline calls received. Correct. Uh, any consequences on something like that? Can you just give us a quick executive summary? Executive summary, most of those were calls regarding spills. And so, oh. Yes. Which, and which, would which be, probably have already been uh, covered in, in the body of the report. Correct. Yes. And that, it's just a, the way the question is asked, they ask, you know, yep. what are your hotline calls? And so our hotline number is MO. So if MO gets a call from typically a citizen and we respond, then I, I log that as a hotline call. We also receive calls directly from the police department, from the yep. fire department. Yep. So, uh, and citizens. From citizens, well, uh, yes. staff, yes. if Good. they. Did you get anything from uh, MyGov? We can get them through MyGov. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, staff a lot of times will just call us direct, directly. So, we're still receiving the calls, they just are not coming in through the hotline. Another question? Uh, look at items uh, number 61. It talks about permit section G3, George yes. 3. Mm -hmm. And it says there's 13, uh, 15 questions. Yep. Uh, they were provided, notifications were provided to ecology. Yes. So if, a, uh, if we decide that a spill warrants notifying ecology. I mean, if it's a very small spill, we clean it up, we record it in our files, it's not that big of a deal. If it's a little bit larger, if it potentially could get into uh, the storm system rather than just being contained on the street surface, then we, re then we contact the Department of Ecology. So that is a G3 notification. So it's just, it, it says that we think that it could constitute a threat to health, public health, or the environment. Um, I may have mentioned this before, but this is uh, Education 101 on water. The Clean Water Act was created by Congress because in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, the Cuyahoga River, I probably missed it, pronounce that correctly, had so much oil in it, it had, was on fire. And that's why the Clean Water Act. Um, let's see. Can, can you just cover real briefly for us all again, the MS4s, <coughs> that policy? The MS-4 is the Municipal Separate Storm Water System or Storm Drainage System. So it's a, in this case, it's a publicly owned storm drainage system. Uh, so in our case, being operated by the City of Auburn. 
um, that is separate from a combined sewer system. So some places like in Seattle, they have right. combined systems where storm drainage and sanitary sewage are in the same pipe, pipe yeah. underground. So this is a separate storm system. So it's stormwater only and it's min municipally operated. So, uh, and we operate it. We operate it? We operate ours, yes. So um, I'd like to see a pipe flow. You must have a chart that shows that system within the city of Auburn. Yeah. The, and does that drain into <laughs> Metro then? No. No. This drains to the rivers, streams, wetlands. So this is our storm drainage system. All of our outfalls to the rivers, all of our pipe networks, catch basins, manholes, that's all the series. That's and the MS4. The MS4. That's the MS4. MS4 is the storm drainage system. Okay. <clears throat> and those are monitored? In what sense? Our detection, detection of? No, we do not monitor the end of our pipes. Why not? Uh, it's very expensive. Mm -hmm. It's uh, difficult to monitor storm drainage. Um, I mean, there's base flow, there's storm events. Uh, contaminants are very uh, sporadic, so you may not see anything, and it may happen when you don't happen to grab a sample. Hmm. Um, so it's, so how often do you take samples of that, or do you? We do not. We do not. So we can be, we could be contaminate, <laughs> contaminating the Green River and White River unknowingly. Well, let me tell you from a, from a, a neighborhood standpoint, uh, I've caught some people putting, you don't even want to know, down in those storm drains mm -hmm. yeah. that are in the streets. And the only thing that's supposed to go down there is rainwater and runoff. Right. And, uh, that's, that's really hard for me to understand why it's not monitored. Technically, it's not a part of the requirements for oh, the here, permit. Oh, here's she'll explain why. Yeah, so it's, it's not part of the requirement for the permit for us to monitor for those things for at the discharge locations. We do do some testing at different times when we're doing different dry permit weather requirements. flow, for instance. Uh, and when it comes to like construction activity, we do monitor every construction site sure. and actually do turbidity monitoring. You also have several locations within the city where they have their own individual industrial permit requirements. So an example of that's the airport, where we actually go and we do monitor our discharge from the airport directly into the storm system. Wow. All right, that's, that's a new one. We have a lot of outfalls to the different rivers in town. So I mean, yeah. trying, to, trying to monitor all of them would no, be no. I, I, very I, cost prohibitive. But you do sample them periodically, though? No. No, we do not. No. 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 Now, typically only with the with the comprehensive planning type process or when the MPDS permit requires us to provide yeah. some specific information related to the permit requirements. At the same time, a lot of how the storm system is built uh, basically has systems in place to try to keep those contaminants out of the discharge. That's our control structures on our, on our storm systems, the catch basins that we go out and we monitor and clean. That's why the MPDS permit, it's so important for us to go and do those inspections on those catch basins to make sure that they're functioning, make sure they're clean, make sure that they're actually doing what they're supposed to be doing to try to keep those contaminants out of the storm water. Well, I'm sure we're meeting the intent of the permit and all of that in all areas. However, sometimes you have to use a little common sense too. And if some areas may be more subject to this kind of a thing and maybe we ought to have some kind of things for our own protection i know i know we're talking money and we're talking staff but you know is it the right thing or the wrong thing to do i don't think it's the wrong thing um and we can we can look at that when we go through our next comprehensive planning process for it um there are some some cautions out there in dealing with doing active monitoring, continuous monitoring on stormwater discharge. Once you know that there's an issue, then you have to track it down to find that issue. And when you're dealing with a, a system that is citywide, that is, is potentially difficult to do. So, which is why the source control is really where we put our emphasis and what the MPDS permit is focused on, is making sure that we're not discharging uh, contaminants into the system in the first place. I, I would like to request that 
we have a uh, report back to the council on what do other cities, how do they manage? I mean, take, take the region, you know, mm -hmm. the South King County area up into Renton. What do they do? I'd like to know. Well, what there's rivers and yeah. places that receive a lot of this outflow. Yeah. There, we do, through the, our, our stormwater permit, participate in a regional monitoring program. So it's a Puget Sound-wide monitoring program, scientifically developed, statistically accurate, uh, hundreds of sample sites around Puget Sound that are looking at uh, what is happening in, in storm drainage and in receiving waters, uh, receive drainage from municipalities. Uh, we contribute financially into that program. Um, and uh, so, so that is one area where we are looking at this, but it is not specifically Auburn, but it is statistically relevant to Auburn. But, uh, and, and that is part of what develops, I believe, the criteria for when we can discharge the Green River, the White River, when you have um, constraints on, on what that discharge can allow to go out there. They look at that monitoring information region-wide because it's not just us, it's everybody else discharging to the same location. Well, I'd, I'd still like to know what the other cities around us do. Okay. Uh, another question? On, on this is on chapter nine monitoring. Mm -hmm. It's uh, on this re on this report. It's page eighty seven or sixteen or sixteen. It's regarding permit requirements and planned compliance activities. Mm -hmm. uh, in the 9.1 permit requirements, it's, uh, the city committed in 2013 to pay 45,000 and some change. And then if you look down at table 9-1, it has payment of 48,000. Yes. <clears throat> so are, are those different things? Well, if you look, uh, in the first paragraph, it says we are paying 45000 In the second paragraph, we are adding an additional payment of 2600 Oh, and that covers, okay. So those okay. two combined become All right. forty seven. of end of question. I should have done that. I'm sorry. Um, and I just wanted to say that the, uh, the definitions of the acronyms, it's, it's really very helpful. It really is. And, uh, you know, you cover illicit discharge, LID, low impact development, MS4 means a municipal separate storm sewer system. So that kind of tweaked me. Uh, oh, okay. And then this is, can I, can I ask another one, Bob? Sure. Unless someone else. You're on a roll. Go ahead. Okay. This is on page. 95 and it's dealing with uh, public education outreach. <coughs> Water festival, fourth and fifth grade students. Here we go again. Did, did your students bring that back? On the water festival? No, probably I don't require, remember that, but. Uh, okay, yeah. but this is the type of thing um, 408 Auburn students attended the festival last year where they learned about stormwater, pollution prevention, wetlands, salmon, drinking water, and sanitary sewer issues. This, I think, would be a great thing to add to the civic, something like that, you know, like a charter or something. Um, now, low and dear to my heart, um, car wash kit program. Mm -hmm. And when I was on the Regional Water Quality Committee, this is what you learn. They talked about uh, car wash kits. City of Kent was on the on the same committee I was on. 
So it tweaked me and I says, God, I wonder if Auburn has car wash kits. We didn't. So we brought the, the Kent water guy up here and our water guy who's not here now. And that was... Uh, Aaron Nix. Huh? Aaron Nix, if I yeah, believe. Yeah, Aaron Nix, right? So we purchased a couple of these car wash kits. And so that's been 13 years ago. But it's a heck of a program where, you know, a lot of the nonprofit organizations have a car washes, right? Well, they can check out one of these kits, collect all the sudsy water, and make sure it goes to the sewer system. That's a great program. It really is. And I'm glad to see that you guys are still, you know, promoting it. Any other questions? Yes. <laughs> hey, I didn't read this for not. I'm going to tell you, and I just... We can tell. <laughs> You're on a roll. Go ahead. Car wash again. Oh, now, here's all of these different call-ins. I was amazed at some of the illicit dumping that some of our citizens do in this town. It's appalling. It really is. And I hope that they're watching, people are watching this. Please don't put in contaminants into the storm drains. It's only going to cost us more money if you do that. And I was really appreciative of the citizens that call in when they see something. I mean, it's huge. And same with the police department. You guys do a great job of identifying illicit dumping of water, of, of chemical. So I read all through this and I was really, I was, I felt real good about it. I really did. And That's you guys of, are doing- a lot of good work. You guys are doing a great job of making sure all this is monitored. Amen. Okay. Are there any uh, tickets or, or typically we uh, of any of these things? We utilize uh, education as our first step in in any case. Uh, try to re uh, get voluntary compliance. Uh, if necessary, then we can escalate to a notice to correct violation, utilizing our code enforcement uh, people. We don't do that very often, but it, but it is an option. I would think there should be a stiff fine for people that violate these things on so, a regular basis. Yeah, so when you go into code enforcement action, then yes, there are some penalties that can be assessed for each day that they have not addressed the issue. So um, they, there can be fines to that. As Chris said, we try to avoid going to that level unless we absolutely need to. We try to work on education and getting compliance from uh, residents and businesses first. Councilmember Pelosi. I would like feedback for the council on the guidelines that code enforcement has on illicit dumping. I'd like to see what they're... Are you talking about spill response, illicit discharge, or dumping of materials on the side of the road? Anything that would have a uh, possibility of going into our storm system. So typically illicit discharge actually starts with the storm staff and they actually do, they go out, they do the investigation and they start the process. Well, I know, but I want to know what the code enforcement policy is when these guys report to them. Because I am, I am appalled at some of these construction contractors that are in this. They shouldn't be educated. They should be fined right away. Bang. Because they're out, and they do this all the time. Discharging right into our, our uh, uh, waterway, so to speak. They should be fined right away. Well, if, they, if they're aware of the violation, I mean, in the beginning, it's where the education comes in. They did the same thing where I live right now when they were building the new facilities over there. 
and it was mostly a learning process for some of the contractors. Bob, <laughs> Deputy Mayor, yes, sir. what I am saying is these a brand new contractor first job, okay, educate them. But a contractor that's been out in the communities all around us for years and years, they should be fined right at the bingo. Yeah, we went through that and the, the, the water quality inspectors came around and they resolved the issues in every case. So. But were they fined? No, they were not. Why not? That's my point. It was the nature of the violation. It wasn't a, it wasn't a uh, something that really created a bigger problem. But have you read these? Yes, I have. There are some in here. We'll make your hair stand on end. Yeah. That, well, yeah. <laughs> so, but I still would like to have the code enforcement policy when it's reported by you guys. To them. So, and, and Jeff can correct me if I'm wrong, if, if Jeff wants to join us up here and, and talk about what the code enforcement requirements are, but there is a process that they have to follow once the, it actually starts the notice of uh, to correct process. So My there, point there's is, time frames sure that are required that by, by our code and by law. And I want to make sure the council understands the disciplinary actions that Sure, one thing and I'll add, and for the record, Jeff T, Assistant Director of Community Development. Um, so, as Chris and Tim have mentioned, Ingrid has mentioned, uh, those uh, incidents get recorded to code enforcement, and there's a few things that we do. I mean, first of all, um, uh, if we're dealing with a contractor, uh, we have uh, our typical code enforcement procedures that we can follow. We also have, uh, and we utilize routinely, the threat of no more inspections, shutting down the job site, no more work. So that is a an effective uh, tool, I guess you would call it, because nobody wants that interruption. No. Um, so, uh, and we have the ability to proceed through our typical notice of infraction, which is a $250 ticket, um, um, notice of penalty, $500 fine with a $100 a day penalty. We have those. Uh, it's interesting you should ask the question because one of the things that we think that we lack and is on our 2018 work plan uh, is to come to council with some suggested language on uh, proceeding to direct fine for egregious penalties uh, that we can, that we know, uh, we witness, uh, we know that the person that we're interacting with knows better. Uh, we would like to uh, have the tool available to us to skip a step. Yep. Skip two steps, maybe, and proceed it directly to more of a ticket for handed it out on the spot. So that is something that you'll see in 2018 coming before council as a, a, a suggestion for uh, from staff for a legislative action. Yeah, because we don't want to be taken advantage of by some of the, some contractors that know better. Right. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Councilmember Brown. Yes, I, um, a couple years ago I went through a teardown and rebuild of my house, second in D, second, uh, northeast in D. Uh, and I would tell you that uh, my contractor was very, um, uh, he was on top of it when it came to uh, preventing the, the dirt and uh, turning into mud and flowing onto the sidewalk or into the street. And I, I just would say that waiting anxiously to move back into our house, had you done a stop order on that contractor, I would have been on that contractor, mm -hmm. you know, with a great deal of diligence. Yes. Uh, so <laughs> I think uh, as far as uh, putting a stop order on, on these contractors, I think is probably about as effective as anything almost, because. Mm -hmm. That's heading towards out of business if that lasts for too long. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned the stormwater management plan. <clears throat> so every contractor for every job has to perform on a, on a plan, or is it just the mar larger contractors? There's different thresholds, mm -hmm. uh, and we have different permits for each of the three thresholds. 
So depending upon how much site disturbance you're creating, you fall into a different level, and which requires uh, additional uh, compliance. So do we let them start a project and go to work without approval of the stormwater management plan? So it depends upon the level of permit. Not every permit requires a stormwater right. management plan for a specific site. If it does rise to the level of permit where they need that stormwater management plan for that permit, that plan must be approved as part of that permit process before they can start work. So that means start any work on the site? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. The stormwater management plan also is, is plan specifications and it's the right. stormwater report, erosion control plan. It is the whole body of that documentation okay. put together. Right. That's the plan. Any other questions before I just a comment? Council comment. Member comment. <laughs> uh, so Jeff answered mm -hmm. the question on the code enforcement, so you don't have to mess with that. Okay? Thank you. Okay, I just wanted to clear that. Thank you. Any other questions? Chris, Tim, thank you. Thanks, guys. Good job. Good, great job. You got a good staff. Oh, we do have that one, though, about <laughs> what cities on the discharge. Okay. We want to know about Get out that. of the weeds. Uh, okay. I think the next item on the list is the uh, ordinance number 6677. Hello. That's a uh, kind of a good segue talking about water quality. So. Uh, for the record, uh, my name is Alexandria Teague. I am a planner two within Community Development and Public Works. Um, tonight, I oh, I just want to make one note that the presentation that you're going to see on your screens is a little bit different than the ones that you have in your packet. That's because I, uh, I simplified uh, the presentation for you because I didn't want to repeat a lot of the materials that are included in your packets. So, um, with that, you have before you the draft ordinance 6677, which is intended to establish an open space as a zoning district within city code and uh, the city zoning map. So, ordinance, ordinance number 6677 includes both a zoning text amendment and a zoning map amendment. And I'd like to refer to them collectively as the open space zoning amendment. So um, I'd like to uh, start with a little bit of history um, about the, uh, the reason why essentially um, the, you have the open space zoning amendment before you. So as you uh, recall, um, uh, well let me just back up. So the purpose of this open space zoning amendment is to establish a zone that will implement the open space land use designation. So this is why I'd like to back up a little bit. So as you remember, at the end of 2015, we went through the process of, of adopting a new comprehensive plan. We also adopted a new comprehensive plan map. Those were done under Ordinance 6584. And the new comprehensive plan and the comprehensive plan map included a new land use designation of open space. And under our existing uh, structure of our comprehensive plan, each land use designation is implemented by at least one zoning district. Uh, and the purpose of each zoning district is to implement its respective land use designation and address the allowed uses and the zoning development standards, such as setbacks and things of that nature. Uh, so currently, there is no open space zone in Auburn City Code, which is, again, the reason why the open space zoning amendment is before you all tonight. So, uh, as you probably read in your packets, there's a, there is a lot of momentum uh, building up to establishing a new open space zone. Uh, the Planning Commission spent quite a bit of time reviewing and discussing the open space uh, zoning amendment. Uh, it, the open space uh, zoning amendment it was considered at four uh, meetings with the Planning Commission beginning in December uh, 2016 and um, all the way to April, through April 4th, 2017. And um, then on July 5th, 2017, Planning Commission conducted a public hearing. 
Um, the public hearing was then continued on to August 8th um, because they, essentially the Planning Commission, I should say, um, were concerned principally by the effect of uh, the uh, proposed amendment on private property owners, um, specifically the Cherneys, because they are the only individual private property owners um, affected by the proposed amendment. And they also wanted to assure, ensure that staff had sufficient coordination with the Muckleshoot Indian Tribe, considering uh, six, uh, I think, about six of their parcels um, under their ownership and within the reservation boundary are affected. Uh, so staff's uh, efforts to notice and to coordinate, uh, to notice the charities and to coordinate with the Muckleshoot Indian Tribe is included uh, in the August 8th staff report. Uh, to Planning Commission, and that's included on page uh, 122 of your packet. Mm -hmm. Apologies. Um, all right, so I'd like to transition, if I may, to uh, the effect and purpose of the open space uh, zoning district. So uh, per the open space intent uh, statement uh, provided on page 113 of your packet, the purpose of this zone is to be applied to parcels that are really largely uh, undeveloped in character, parcels that feature some natural urban conservancy shoreline areas, and I'll, I'll add that those are the natural being the most restrictive of our um, shoreline designation. Uh, significant wildlife habitat areas, large stormwater detention ponds, or floodplain ponds, utility corridors, and watersheds. Watersheds are those areas um, of uh, significance for our, our water, essentially. Uh, or areas with significant development restrictions. Think like really, really steep slopes. So the majority of the affected parcels, or I should say the parcels included in the proposed open space um, uh, zoning amendment, uh, they're actually owned by the city of Auburn. Uh, and they generally feature uh, either a critical area, such as a wetland or utility infrastructure. I think the Auburn Environmental Park, or AEP, is a good example of um, uh, parcels or an area that's included in the proposed uh, amendment. Uh, the majority of the non-city owned parcels are actually owned by another jurisdiction, such as King County, or a private utility, such as Puget Sound Energy. And they're actually encumbered by utility infrastructure, like a transmission line. Um, the remaining five non-city owned parcels that are, again, not owned by a government agency or private utility, are privately owned and also feature um, environmental or developmental constraints. Um, so I, I mentioned earlier that the Planning Commission requested that staff coordinate a review with the Muckleshoot Indian Tribe, and they even made uh, coordinating with the Muckleshoot Indian Tribe part of their uh, recommendation to council. Therefore, I wanted to mention um, how the open space zoning amendment applies to Indian lands. That's those lands owned by the Muckleshoot Indian Tribe and within their reservation boundary. So as provided in the Auburn City Code, um, there's a section 181050. The, the intent of that section is to address how city zoning and land use regulations uh, <coughs> land use regulations apply to um, to Indian lands. So again, I want to re, uh, kind of reinforce that the purpose of this uh, proposed open space zoning amendment is to apply it, such that if the lands were no longer, or such those Indian lands were no longer under Indian jurisdiction, so perhaps the they were to be sold, or I don't know, however, not include the reservation or most likely not to be sold. So if they were to change in ownership or jurisdictional character, basically, then our, uh, our, our land use regulations would apply. So that's essentially how it, the, the, the relationship between this, this uh, proposed amendment and Indian lands. Um, so, uh, 
with that, I've just briefly discussed the proposal to enact the new open space zone in city code and on the city's zoning map. Um, this item is tentatively scheduled for the February 20th um, council meeting, and I'm readily available to answer any of your questions. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Sure. Really quick, when yeah. is this going to come to us? Uh, February 20th. Thank you very much. Okay, well, at this point in the meeting, I uh, will turn the meeting over to our finance and economic development. Do you want to have a break? Okay, let's uh, take a six minute break. Would that be enough? I thought. I'm no expert, but so I didn't realize. Let me use this monitor. monitor Auburn. <laughs> Doesn't make sense, man. Well, here's our WQC right here. She'll, she'll raise hell. <laughs> I'm excited. I was really excited for the first meeting we had with you. Lots That's an important lots issue. To huh. All about water, man. Sitting behind you. 
earth next to that one, Lisa. Yeah, she was at the uh, water, uh, regional water uh, meeting with Nan, so I'm going to work with her. Mm-hmm. That feels better. It's good. <laughs> but don't get in the weeds. <coughs> don't want you. <laughs> don't want to get in the weeds. This is interesting. Our new council member needs to know some of this stuff, too. Okay, well, we're all present, so I guess we can reconvene. At this point, we will turn it over to the um, finance and economic development for discussion items. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, next up is item 4B, and uh, Shelley Coleman, I think, is up on the hot seat. Thank you. This pertains to the SST, and I assume it's not the supersonic transport, no. <laughs> but the streamlined sales tax. Well, the SST is done, and SST is almost done. How's that for a segue? Yeah. Good. Oh, good. I wanted to give you an update on streamlined sales tax and where we're at with it. As you know, this goes back to 2007, or, yeah, 2007, 2008, when there was a sourcing change, which uh, there's a memorandum I sent out to you, I think, last August. If you'd like to see that again, I'm happy to send it to you, but it's the sourcing change. Would be, it used to be, if you lived in Renton, you went to Tukwila, went to a storefront in Tukwila and bought a piece of furniture. It was warehoused in Kent, and then it was sent to your home in Renton. Kent would get the sales tax because it was warehoused in Kent, even though the store is in Tukwila and the purchaser lived in Renton. Now, when the purchaser goes to that Tukwila storefront and the piece of furniture comes out of Kent and goes to Renton to the final destination, that's destination based, Renton gets the sales tax. What that has done for cities such as Auburn and Kent in particular, as well as Tukwila and Fife and Sumner to a lesser degree and Issaquah, is we are cities that are heavily, have a heavy uh, distribution, warehousing, manufacturing center. And we cities, these cities are no longer receiving sales tax that they used to receive. Um, what happened is the mitigation was marked and set in 2000 eight and 2009 and if you recall in 2008 and 2009 we're in the middle of the recession and the state year ran from July 1 2008 through June 30 2009 and the city of Auburn sales tax <laughs> decreased in 2008 from 2007 11 and a half percent and then the following year, 2008 to 2009, in a calendar year, an additional 24%. So it's a total of almost, uh, or about 35% year over year. That's when the, the mitigation was set. It took a snapshot in time, they measured how much the city lost, and they came up with two million and change. So that was our mitigation that was set at that time. And with the sourcing change, they thought that the state Felt that there would be felt or believed that there would be voluntary, voluntary, internet commerce that would come in and offset that mitigation, and in a few years we'd be whole. Well, over the past 10 years, the city has now mitigated 1.92 million, so about $80,000, or about $8,000 a year, has increased for the voluntary. So it hasn't been robust, to say the least. Here we are today. We're still being mitigated for 1.92 million. And since then, Kent in particular, they're mitigated over $4 million a year. But a study was done by uh, region, regional, uh, regional, I don't want to say regional transit, but um, I can't think of it now. Puget Sound, Regional. Puget Sound Regional Council, thank you. Uh, that can't, they're saying today, that $4 million loss that was benchmarked 10 years ago is about $12 million today. 
So that's about three times the amount. So if you look at Auburn and apply that same percentage to Auburn, it would be six million. So it's significant. But anyway, we have, uh, you know, we, back in 2010, we went through some reductions and we've grown slowly as our revenue has allowed us to grow. And most of that has been other revenue sources. But back to streamlined sales tax. So there's a couple of things right now that I, I really want to focus on. And one is the first item in the memorandum, on page one of the memorandum, where literally, as you know, the budget was passed at the 11th hour on June 30th, the state budget. And in the ado that was going on with getting the budget passed, about 2.3 million or 10% was not funded. The need was to be 23 million, and they funded it at less than 21 million. There's a supplemental budget that they're tr or they're trying to put something into the additional appropriate uh, put an additional appropriation into the supplemental budget. Hopefully that happens. If we applied that 10% across the board to everyone, it would be about 380,000. And of course, that's my calculation. You know, I'm just taking. The, the assumption, 10% reduction, 10% reduction in what we receive would be about 380,000 moving forward. Now, the House Bill 2163, that was passed also with the budget. And what that does is it puts into place a Marketplace Fairness Act, as well as it sunsets the Streamlined Sales Tax Mitigation for cities such as Canton, Auburn, and Tukwila, and Issaquah, and Fife, and Sumner. And the last payment, I'm getting conflicting reports, but it looks like it's going to be September of 2019. However, between, before that happens, and before the sunset, there was a slight provision or a small note in the bill that said the Department of Revenue would look again at mitigation matched against the Marketplace Fairness Act and see how cities such as Kent and Auburn were doing. And right now, they can, Department of Revenue will do that measurement. <coughs> However, they're not really in a position to say, well, what kind of things could the legislature do? What are some uh, initiatives they could do to make these cities whole? And this is where the, a task force or a committee has been formed with AWC and Kent heading it up. And there's chambers on it and cities to, to meet about monthly, once a month through August, to come up with some suggestions to provide the legislature some things that they could do. And this would go into the memorandum the Department of Revenue has to have to the legislature by November of this year. The Department of Re uh, Revenue wants it from these, this committee by September of this year. So that's where we're at with that. Now, on the marketplace fairness, there's some news, as I put in this memorandum, that the reason in internet catalog sales, and it's not just internet catalog, if you call up and order something, sales tax is not charged unless there's brick and mortar at that store in your state. And back, this is all based upon a court decision by the Supreme Court in 1992, Quill versus North Dakota, where they said, before uh, you can collect sales tax, you need to have brick and mortar. Some of the judges on the Supreme Court, the newest one, Gorsuch, 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 Gorsuch. Gorsuch, from Colorado, when he was sitting on the Colorado court, he made comments saying that it would be great to have this come back in front of the courts due to the changes that have happened in technology and purchasing. There's also, and I can't tell you which justice, but another Supreme Court justice had written in some of his comments that it was time to revisit this. Well, it's going to be revisited this spring, South Dakota, Wayfair, and that is going in front of the Supreme Court, and they should have a decision by June, whether there can be interstate sales tax on commerce and what defines brick and mortar. 
whereas some states, as in Washington, have identified it to be something other than brick and mortar. It's if you have internet presence. There's a handful of states that are starting to move in this direction to identify brick and mortar as something different. And we are hopeful. This is kind of aside from the mitigation because this would be good for all the cities. And the Marketplace Fairness Act in Washington, it calls for businesses to register with the state. And if they register to register and collect sales tax and remit it. However, if they choose not to do that, they can keep a list of people, most recent address or email address of who they've sold to over $10,000 in product and submit that list to Department of Revenue on an annual basis. They also would like them to do things like stamp on the invoice and any of the materials that go with the product to the buyer that use taxes do and you need to submit it to Department of Revenue. And the big player here, and I'm going to say the name, we can't mention names due to, um, but this one we can mention because they've come right out and said, it's us and we're going to start charging sales tax and that's Amazon. But you can probably think of a, other, a couple of other big uh, referrers or marketplace facilitators that don't collect sales tax and remit it. It's, so, you know, the big one, Amazon says they're going to do it. I don't know if you noticed, I, you know, I didn't think much of it. I went back and looked at some of my orders from last year and some had sales tax on them and some did not. So it depends on whether they're a facilitator or a referrer or there's three categories there, but um, whether they collect the sales tax. Hopefully we will get to the point and what will happen if the Supreme Court overturns or overturns the Quill decision from 18 year, or 16 years ago, that'll be good, but how are they gonna go about that? Because there are states that have done the sourcing change and Washington is one of them. So the thought is these are the states that are streamlined and their sales tax will be the first that can begin to collect the sales tax. But that'll be all worked out after there's some Supreme Court decision. Council Member Shelly, um, I ordered from Amazon and I noticed the same thing that some things that I ordered, they charged me taxes and others they didn't. It all depends on how much I, I spend. Um, so when are they thinking or when did you hear they're going to start implementing? January 1. January 1. Wow. So I, I think that anything that you go out and order from Amazon now, you're going to see a sales tax on. Okay. Any questions? Thank you for the update. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for adding taxes to us. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, Shelley is still up here. Uh, ordinance number 6678. A little background on this for some of you that weren't here back in 2010 or late 2008 or 9. The city this beautiful promenade out here in a city park and did that's what you see on top underneath there's utility and infrastructure improvement stormwater improvement which was required before the blocks could be developed out this was a local revitalization funding it was from the state it was good for 25 years they would pay up to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars of any debt over a period of 25 years that the city incurred they'd match up to 50 percent and 250000 for any debt the city incurred <coughs> to do these types of improvements. And the city took them up on that offer and issued the debt for these improvements. And every year, the city must do an ordinance and a report. It's another report that we send along with this ordinance telling them what, the le what they have to levy in a sales tax credit. This is an additional sales tax to anyone this is a deduction from the state portion of sales tax, which is diverted from the state to the city to meet that debt service payment. And so this is an annual thing that, that you will see for the next through 2034. 
and this is 18, so that's going to be another 16 years that we'll see this. We have to do this every year. Right? Every year, because we're changing the levy rate, because it depends on how much we think sales tax will be in the city, and so it may go up, it may go down. And that's what this is about. This will be on the city council agenda next week, next Monday. Or Tuesday, I guess it would be. Any questions? Thank you again, Shirley. You're welcome. Thank you, Shirley. Okay, are there any other discussion items for the council? Yes. Councilmember Clover. Tonight I attended the via a tele, teleconference call with uh, King Conservation District. And they were to approve uh, a $20,000 grant for the Auburn International Farmers Market. I commented on public, I, I commented during public comment time. We were awarded the $20,000 uh, uh, for the 2018th market. And this brings our total from KCD since we started the market in 2009 to approximately $200,000 for the market. Okay. So it was, uh, a, reminder it was a win win. It's going to be at Lesco yeah. Park. Let's go park. Mm -hmm. Yep, we're here by the train station. Yep. Okay. Any new business? Matrix. We've had a few TBDs on here for the schedule, and uh, I think we'd like to try to see if we can assign some dates to these. I. Uh haven't heard from our attorney Dan yet to find out when um, his uh, office can come in and talk to us. I need a date on that, and then I'm meeting with Dana next uh, next week, so we'll get a date down for for her to do that. I I did just, if I could just help out a little. I did talk to uh, the prosecutors, and uh, they are putting a report together, and uh, I will get information in terms of when that will be ready and um, pass that on. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, come on. Anything on those? We're meeting on the 14th. We're going to go through the agenda and we can discuss then whether or not they can come to the 26th meeting or push it off. Okay. That'll be both of those yes. items? Or anything else they may have identified at that point. What items are they? What items? They're the uh, community sustainability. Well, there's a number. Two, four three, and left. four. Which? Two, mm -hmm. three, and four. Okay. And uh, I think we've got one TBD down here for finance. Lovable cities. Is Jeff Tate still in the audience? I can't speak to that at this time. So uh, as soon as anybody gets any of these dates, please uh, give me a shout mm -hmm. no, so we can get them on there. I do know that we need to put a placeholder uh, under finance, and we have biennial budget due this year. We're going to have several work groups. Uh, mm -hmm. So how many uh, working sessions are we planning, Michelle? Well, um, I know the mayor's trying to get a retreat together, or, or there's a retreat scheduled. And that's not finalized yet, but there will be a, a, pro, a kind of a budget 101 thing. And I'm really switching it up this year of what we've done in the past. And then we will probably be meeting in August to go over. We generally schedule three with council to go over the, the budget. Don't get rid of your cups. I really <laughs> vision Oh, I'll have the cups there. But I like those cups. Yeah. <laughs> But I'm, I'm going to interject the, the big picture into there to kind of broaden it. I focused on what you're going to see and what the format's going to look like, but I'm going to go a little broader and then come down. Yeah, I think everybody got a projected agenda uh, that uh, Danny put, put out, so mm -hmm. be thinking about those study session dates and everything. I have a, I've got a couple. Okay. One is uh, on March 20, this is uh, for, uh, this is for 
the uh, salmon color. Okay. March 20, well, National League of Cities Service Line Program. Service Line Program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're not, on, it's not on the uh, council matrix, but it is on the agenda, the projected agenda. Well, I'm just, I'm just saying. I, I agree with my no, colleague. No, he needs to be on, he needs to be on the matrix. So what I'm saying is, the guy's traveling from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania for March 26th. Yeah. March 26th, service line program, parens, NLC, sponsor. And then I have another one. You confirm this. Uh, yes. Mobile home park closure. Uh, that's for next week, and that could go under uh, red. It could be discussed under red. Two twenty-six. Mobile home park closure procedure. And if you want to put in friends, you could put in city code 14.20. And then there will also be some RCWs, you know, brought into that as well. Okay. February 26, two weeks. Do we have any other additions to the matrix? Thank you, Bob. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. I, uh, it's probably not a matrix item, but... Uh, I uh, received a communication from my international union uh, that uh, told me that they're intending to do a member profile piece uh, for the National Journal um, on, on me and my being on the city council. It's something that uh, the machinists encourage is for members to run for public office. Yeah. And so probably the first meeting, uh, city council meeting in March, they may be here and do a short bit of video. I uh, spoke with uh, city attorney and uh, the mayor about the permissibility of this. There doesn't seem to be any problem with that, but I wanted to run it by the council and see if anybody had any strong objections uh, with just having them set up and well, that, that would be at the March 12th study session uh, pro, no it'll be a regular uh, session a regular city council regular meeting? city council meeting. what's the purpose of that featuring uh, a machinist union member that did run for office. Well, is this going to be on a resolution then? Or? Uh, no, this is merely just a video crew that's oh, going to come in. Oh, oh, oh. Short, uh, short video. They're not going to be here for long. They're just going to take a, a, a little bit so of they're video. Gonna, they're going to film. Right. Okay. Our, um, yeah, that's oh, our meeting. Is this a warning for me to be on my best <laughs> behavior? Yeah, no more swearing or throwing stuff at people. Yeah, that yeah. kind of thing. Make sure you wear your tie. You haven't done it before. I just don't want you to start. That's all. Oh, he hasn't. You oh, have maybe been here. I, maybe I haven't. I didn't oh, see I this. I don't think you've ever heard me curse. Yeah, maybe not throw some. Curse. I don't think that's an item for the matrix, but I think it is. <laughs> just a heads up for everybody. Good. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, with that, if there's no other business before the council, I will adjourn the meeting. All right. Get the gavel, man.